Welcome to Retiring Well. Folks, we got a great show for you today. Um, we're going to talk about um, alpha, what that is, a little bit about beta, um, and talk to you about how globally interconnected we really are, um, the Phillips curve, um, 529 plans, and then we talk a little bit about PE ratio. So stay tuned. Retiring Well, brought to you by Centennial Wealth Advisory, financial advisors specializing in retirement planning and serving all of Northern Michigan. Retiring Well, helping you plan for a successful and comfortable retirement. Retiring Well, plan to retire well. Hi, in this segment, I want to talk to you about Alpha. Now, folks, this is just more financial jargon that in our industry that we use, but it's something that we look for in a portfolio. Now, alpha is, is simply this. It's basically, the, it's, it's usually represented in a single number, okay? And it's representing what a portfolio has done compared to a benchmark or what maybe a mutual fund has done compared to a benchmark. So for example, let's say that I've got a large cap mutual fund. Now folks, that's just a mutual fund that's holding large company stocks. Now probably the, the best benchmark to compare that portfolio with would be the S&P 500. Being the S&P 500 is the largest 500 companies in the, in the US. So I'm gonna look at that large cap fund or, or portfolio and compare it with the benchmark, which is the S&P 500. Now, if alpha equals zero, that means that that portfolio, that mutual fund was perfectly matched or, or performed with the benchmark. So, you know, this one did 7% and this one did 7%, that would give that one an alpha of zero. Now, an alpha of three, for example, meant that that portfolio did 3% better than its benchmark. Okay, now if that number was represented as a negative, okay, let's say minus five, it was the alpha. That means that that portfolio, that mutual fund did 5% less than the benchmark that it was being compared to. So can you see how important this is to know? You'll hear a lot of these companies, portfolios, and uh, mutual funds out there trying to say they're, they're trying to achieve alpha, right? What they're basically saying is they're trying to do better than what its corresponding benchmark is. So knowing what that alpha is in a portfolio is very, very important. Now, I've talked before on what, what is another financial jargon or name called beta. Now, beta is just simply how volatile an account is, all right? So a beta of like, let's say 0.8 means that it's 20% it's, it's, it's less volatile than the portfolio it's being compared to, okay? Or to that benchmark, I should say. A beta that's over one, you know, means it's more volatile than the benchmark that it's being, you know, compared to. So knowing alpha, knowing beta, these are very, very important things that you're gonna to wanna to know when you're looking at a portfolio. We have the tools to get behind a lot of these, these portfolios, these mutual funds, and actually telling you what those two things are. If that's important for you to know, then I encourage you to give us a call and we can tell you what, that, what those are. We here at Centennial Wealth Advisory realize that everyone has been affected by this coronavirus in one way or another. We watch your retirement accounts drop significantly in value and we have questions. Can I retire in a recession? How will the coronavirus affect my retirement? How do I develop an income stream in a recession? Can I still retire this year? If these are concerns of yours, contact us today for a free initial consultation and learn what you can do now to help you weather the storm. Simply call 888-608-5825 or visit sunwealth.com and let us help you plan to retire well. Have you ever seen that soap opera called As the World Turns? Well, folks, as it comes to our markets, our markets are, are very much connected with the rest of the world. We are much more globally connected than we realize. Now, I challenge you to take any browser, your web browser, and, and go to that financial section where you can see what the S&P 500 is doing, and, and they show you that chart. And I want you to compare it with another ticker called the VEU. That's Victor Edward Uncle, okay? Now basically, that's, a, that's all the rest of the world except us. 
Now, I want you to compare those two things, and I think you're gonna find, no matter how far back you go, that if you watch that chart, our, our markets are pretty much going in tandem with the rest of the world. Again, much more globally connected than we like to believe. So, it, so how, is that, how is that the case? Well, first of all, you have to understand that 40% of the our S&P 500, which is just the, the largest 500 companies in the United States, 40% of their revenue is tied uh, to overseas sales. So, so that's, that's how, why we're so connected. I challenge you, if you travel outside the United States to go into any major city, look around, look down any street, and you're gonna find a number of American franchises. You're gonna see McDonald's, KFC, you're gonna see Coca-Cola sold, all right? Um, I know as a fact that Apple, 20% of their sales are in China alone. So you have to understand if so much of our revenue is being generated overseas, if they're having an economic slowdown, how long is it gonna be before it eventually hits our shores? Okay, now most of us always wanna look in our own backyard. You know, we might have a good job, maybe it's a, maybe it's a well-paying job. We're feeling very secure about where we're at in this economy. And so, and we look around, we look at our own town that we're in, our city, maybe we see a lot of construction happening. Um, you know, we just see the economy doing very, very well in our own community and our own pockets. And we tend to believe that everybody else is doing the same. Um, that's just an, an emotional attachment that we might have or a belief we have because we're doing so well. But folks, again, I say that's not usually always the case. You know, if they're, if they're struggling overseas, you know, how much longer is it going to be before it finally reaches our shores, right? Now, we have the ability to get behind any portfolio and show you just exactly how much foreign exposure you have. If you have concerns about how they're doing foreign-wise, then you're gonna want low exposure to that. Well, we can show you that. So if you're somebody that wants that information, really wants to see how you're, how you're, how you're set up, then please give us a call. Folks, I, I hope you find these valuable. Um, it's, a, it's very important to us at Centennial Wealth, um, especially when we're talking about financial jargon, that we educate you. Um, the, these, these things that we use as we're analyzing portfolios are very important. Um, you know, if I'm, if I'm somebody that's trying to achieve alpha, or I hear that, and I, you know, that's a good thing, right? Um, I mean, if, it, if it's beating the benchmark and, and that portfolio has consistently done that, I'm about that all day long, right? But what if it's beta is, is you know, saying something that, you know, it's t I'm taking I'm way more risk than I really want to. Um, yeah, yes, I'd like to have alpha, but you know, I, do I want it? How much risk am I willing to take on in getting, getting alpha, right? So looking at a portfolio and, and understanding you know, what those are and making sure that it's in line with how I want my investments to go is, is really, really important. And then when I was talking about um, you know, how globally connected we are, um, you know, if we've seen anything in this pandemic, it's just been about how supply chains have been completely um, disrupted. Um, how many of us knew that most of our pharmaceutical drugs were being manufactured in China? You know, and then how dangerous was that to our national security when, you know, um, you know, especially if we ended up in any kind of a trade war with them, we couldn't get the pharmaceuticals we needed. So that, that, that kind of thing is scary. You know, I remember when I was in college, they talked about free trade and how, how important, that, important that was. You know, if I'm a country that can, uh, I'm just gonna use a, a raw example because I think this is the one they used when I was in school. But let's say there's a country because of, you know, the easy access to leather and, you know, and, and you know, their labor force, they can make cho shoes very, very cheaply. Um, that's a good thing if they can export those shoes to other countries, let's say even ourselves, right? Because we're, we're getting the ability because of their productivity, their ability to produce that shoe and make it cheaply and, and export it over to us at a low price. Well, that's good all the way around because now we have more money in our pockets. It can be spent to other things. What if it's something that we produce really well and, and, and efficient and cheap, and we can export it to others. And you, you can see how free trade can work really, really well when it's working. I think where we get into trouble is where countries start to manipulate um, by, you know, putting on, uh, you know, putting these tariffs on, you know, that might be unreasonable. 
um, now, now it's maybe an unfair advantage. And so I think, you know, um, especially having, you know, now coming to, you know, going through this pandemic, what's this going to look like now when you got a lot of countries that are now starting to become what I would call more nationalistic and, you know, they're, you know, what's that going to look like for free trade? Don't know the answers to a lot of those questions, but it's something we're going to be wanting to pay very, very close attention to as we, as we go forward, especially as we, we come off this pandemic, hopefully sometime <laughs> in the future, and, and we know what that kind of looks like. So anyway, well, I, I'm going to talk now next about what's called the Phillips Curve. Um, I'm going to talk about 529 plans, so stay tuned. Hi, my name is Larry Flynn. I'm a financial advisor, senior partner here at Centennial Wealth Advisory. Listen, with this coronavirus, it created unprecedented times. High unemployment, you got a lot of businesses not reopening. Whether there comes a treatment or a vaccine for this disease, we don't know. There's just a lot of questions, a lot of uncertainty. But your financial well-being is still very important. And if you're in retirement and your retirement, then getting some good sound financial advice is, is gonna be critical. So in these unprecedented times, we're understanding that safety is a concern, and so we're offering a couple options. If you're willing to talk by phone or wanna do a virtual meeting, whether that be Zoom or something like that, we're offering that ability to do that. If you're somebody that does wanna meet in person, we're trying to accommodate that as well. We're saying, you know, we're not gonna have any two clients meet at once. We're sanitizing it before and after you're here, and we're keeping the proper social distancing in place while we meet. So if these are a couple options you might want to pursue, we encourage you to just give us a call on the number that's on the screen or visit our, our website at sun-wealth.com and, and just basically you can set up a meeting there. Stay safe. If you have some financial concerns and need to address those, then certainly give us a call. forward to helping you plan to retire well. In this segment of Chalk Talk, I want to talk to you about what's called the Phillips Curve. Now, sometimes you'll, you'll hear about this in the news. It's, it's something that the Feds, uh, Federal Reserve used to pay great attention to. Okay, I'm going to first talk to you about what it is, show you, you know, what it's all about, and then I'm going to show you why they're scratching their head anymore um, and why this Phillips Curve isn't holding historically to what it's done in the past. So first of all, what you have here is you've got, you've got this, this line here being inflation, inflation going from zero to, you know, let's say 8%, all right? And in this axis, you've got, you got unemployment going from zero to 8%. Now, historically, when unemployment has been very high, we've had inflation be very low. Okay, but when unemployment has been very low, we've had inflation be very high. Now, you can almost plot this, but you know how this might work is, let's say we had you know, unemployment of 2%, and then, and then we ended up with inflation of, of 6%, okay? Or let's say we had inflation of uh, you know, uh, 2%, 2 but we had unemployment of 6%. That's basically, you got the, they're plotting these points, A and B, and it creates basically what they call a Phillips curve. Now, the Federal Reserve would typically track this because as they see more inflationary pressures it going up, they, they'd loosen their monetary policy by either lowering interest rates or putting more money in the economy because they, they know, you know high unemployment is, or low unemployment is gonna be on the rise. Now, why is low unemployment uh, an issue? Well, if you have low employment, that means more people are working, they have more monies in their pocket, and they tend to, there's now what they call increase in demand, and when you have lower supply, that creates inflation because prices start to go up. Now, they don't want prices to go up too fast, 
because if you have prices going up too fast, now that's, that's, that lowers people's purchasing power and then that has a negative effect on, on earnings as a whole. So you know, this balancing act that they're trying to play here is how that's represented in the Phillips curve. Now, now that's what it's all about, but what's the problem with it? Well, of recent, we've had low record unemployment I think it's a, you know, we're, we're rapidly approaching full employment at three and a half percent as of the airing of this show. And we, we're only seeing inflation be about two percent. So historically, we've had this relationship between inflation and unemployment that, that the feds would work with. Today, it's not, it's not plotting according to the old Phillips curve. So some are arguing it's, it's probably not even working anymore. It shouldn't even be used as a guide. But I thought it interesting for you just to know and understand. So I, hopefully you found that valuable. Um, again, if we can ever be of any help, give us a call. Your grandchildren are precious to you. They are your life. This is your time to have that special relationship. Taking care of yourself is taking care of them. Centennial Wealth Advisory is offering a free, no obligation retirement review to make sure you don't run out of money during your retirement. Centennial Wealth Advisory, your best is yet to come. Hi, in this segment, I want to talk about 529 plans. Now, these are accounts that parents and grandparents can put money into, okay, with after-tax dollars. Now, for the state of Michigan, I think they allow you a deduction for MESP, but, um, but it's money you can put into an account that's called a 529 plan. It grows tax-deferred, and then if it's used for education, it's, then none of it is taxable. Now, just about every state has some version of this 529 plan. I know, and I know some of the universities will have their own 529 plans too. Now, 529, you know, how it gets that name, it's just the IRS tax code that created <laughs> these kind of plans. Now, mutual funds, just about every mutual fund company out there will have these 529s that you could do with them also. So there's a, there's a myriad of them out there that you can participate in. And again, they're like a Roth IRA in the sense that you're putting in with that after tax dollars, they grow tax deferred, and then if they're used for the proper purpose, then it's gonna be tax free. Now, what are, what are educational costs that it can be used for? Well, at, for any university, room and board, okay, the actual tuition, their books, basically any educational costs they have for that education. Now, 529 plans allow for any tuition from K to 12. Okay, so you can use it for, for that as well. Now, the state of Michigan has two plans. They have one called the Michigan Education Savings Plan, MESP. Now, that one is looks like mostly others. You're putting money in, and it'll have you know, some, some counts that you can choose from, conservative, moderate risk, and basically you put into them, and then those funds basically manage that money going forward. And what you're hoping is that they grow to enough to be able to cover those costs when the time comes that you need them. All right, now they're subject to market risk, which is in, in college education, university costs have been rising at you know, very dr dramatic rates of recent years. So you know, the growth on these, unless they're totally aggressive in the market, is having a hard time keeping up with those college costs as they're increasing. The one I really like is called Michigan Education Trust. Now this one is more of a prepaid tuition plan. You literally pay for the costs ahead of time. But the nice thing about them is it doesn't matter how the college costs rise, you're basically guaranteeing that education is going to be paid for. So I can pay for it today two years at the university or two years at community college at today's rates for what it's going to cost me down the road. So I really like those. Now, for these 529 plans, you've got to be careful. If, it, if the kids have them in their name, they can be, for FAFSA reasons, financial aid, 20% of it can be considered their, you know, uh, their assets. But if you put it, leave it in the parent's name, only 5.64% is considered assets for FAFSA. Now, grandparents can put into these 529 plans, and that's not a bad idea. Not usually good in the first couple years, um, but in the last couple years of their education can be very advantageous. So if you're somebody that's trying to save for college or, and maybe want some help trying to figure out which plan might be good for you, give us a call. We'd be glad to help. All right, folks, I, you know, I have to tell you that uh, uh, when we aired that segment on the, on, on the Phillips Curve, it was in February this year, right before... Um, this whole pandemic thing was starting to unfold. 
uh, we were come off coming off historically low unemployment and and it was literally about um, how do we have such low unemployment when and there's really been no inflationary concerns um, now what do we have it's completely the opposite you know now we have high unemployment I think the big question out there is how long is it is it going to be before we even get back to the levels that we had before, right? So, so now what are some of the fears? Um, well, guess what? It's a big question mark, you know, with all this stimulus money they put out there, as people do start to get back to work and this economy starts to recover, what, what's that going to look like now with all this money they put into play? Is that going to create more inflationary pressures, <laughs> right? Um, because people got all this money and this pent up demand that might have been there during this pandemic and now they're out spending and, and prices are rising. Or because of the high unemployment and because of going through the pandemic, are people going to start being more savers? Um, you know, they, they, they might not have liked the financial condition they were in entering this pandemic and they're saying, you know what, I'm not going to let that happen to me again. And all of a sudden we start saving more rather than spending. Now, what, what do we have? We have deflationary. Um, pressure. So I think right now that is going to be the big, big question, especially after all the money the feds have are, are you know, pumping into this economy to kind of keep it chugging along. You know, uh, the big question mark is, you know, what's, what's that going to do? And then 529 plans, uh, you know, uh, you know, grandparents love these accounts because they, you know, they've traditionally now they're through their careers. They, they, they have a the money, they want to leave a legacy behind and, and, and having their kid, their grandkids go to college is, is, is very important to them. So um, just hopefully if you didn't know about those 529 plans, um, you do now and it's maybe something you want to, you know, be a part of. Um, now I said in that segment that I like METs, uh, you know, there's another advisor in our office, like he likes MESPs better. So, um, you know, it, it really the key is do your research, you know, um, know the pros and cons to those plans and, and, and pick the one that best works for you. So anyway, I'm going to talk about PE ratios um, in the next segment in Chalk Talk and I'll, so stay tuned. We here at Centennial Wealth Advisory realize that everyone has been affected by this coronavirus in one way or another. We watch your retirement accounts drop significantly in value and we have questions. Can I retire in a recession? How will the coronavirus affect my retirement? How do I develop an income stream in a recession? Can I still retire this year? If these are concerns of yours, contact us today for a free initial consultation and learn what you can do now to help you weather the storm. Simply call 888-608-5825 or visit sunwealth.com and let us help you plan to retire well. Welcome back. In this segment, I want to talk to you about stock buybacks. Why do companies do them? Well, one reason they might do it is to give their key execs some bonuses, right? They buy their stock back, give it as a bonus. But there's another reason sometimes they might do this. It's regarding price to earnings ratios. Now, just to show you how this works, this is a stock selling for $100 per share, all right? And let's say its earnings per share is $5. That's going to be a PE ratio of 20, the 100, the stock price divided by its earnings. Now, why is that an important number to understand with stocks or, or funds? Because the market historically is traded at about 16, 17 times earnings. So if you have a PE ratio higher than that, you might have one that's, you know, maybe a little overvalued. You, what you want is a, is a low PE ratio. So, you know, take, the, take this company, it's got, it's got earnings of $4 million. It's got 100 million shares outstanding, meaning there are 100 million shares out there that people can buy or own. If you take the earnings divided by the number of shares, it gives you $4 per earnings. All right, so if I take that $100 stock price and I divide by the $4 in earnings, I'm now getting a price to earnings ratio of now 25. Now it's a little bit high, right? So might, what, what might this company do? Well, let's say it buys back some of its shares. So it's gonna buy back, let's say in this particular case, just so we can understand it, let's say they buy back 20 million shares, all right? 
the earnings don't change. The company's still only making $4 million, but now they only have 80 million shares outstanding. If I do the PE ratio on this now, what am I going to see? If I take that 80 divided by the 4, now I'm basically back up to a PE ratio of 20. Now why is this important to understand? In this corporate stock buyout, listen, my earnings didn't change. Was my company really any healthier? But by buying back that stock, it made me look like it was. Now you're hearing a lot about this in the news, you know, corporations buying back their stock. What would we rather see them do with those earnings? Well, pay them back in dividends to the shareholders might be a nice thing. How about they, you know, reinvested into research and development or capital expenditures that might make their company grow? Now, companies do that, but what the concern is and what you're hearing in the news is when they're doing this and it's not really improving their earnings much, maybe not so good. So anyway, I hope that kind of educates you a little bit on why they do that and especially how it's affected with PE ratios. Folks, we have the ability to take any portfolio and actually calculate as a whole what the P.E. ratio of, is of that portfolio. Very important to understand, especially if it's kind of way above the historic averages. So I encourage you, if you're somebody who really wants to know that, give us a call. Folks, I, find, I hope you found that valuable. Um, you got to understand P.E. ratios are very important. As, as a general rule, the, the, the market follows earnings, you know, and as long as earnings are going up for these corporations, you're going to see the market move uh, continually higher. If earnings are not there, um, it may shoot up a little while longer, but sooner or later, it's going to hit a mean. Now, in the past, like we said, that's been 16, 17 times earnings. If I'm well above that, I'm maybe in frothy territory. Um, or maybe what they call overvaluation territory. If it's at that or well below, maybe I'm in bargain territory. So actually knowing what your PE ratio um, is on your portfolio um, is going to be very important. So, um, and then and when I aired that, you know, and talked about these corporations doing their buybacks, um, that was very prevalent um, in recent years. But now with the pandemic, what we're finding is that where the government is, is, has been going in and giving aid to these companies, they basically said, okay, we're gonna give you aid, um, but you can't use that money for you know, um, stock buybacks for a period of time. They kind of put a moratorium on that for a period of time. Um, and I, I don't know what those dates are, but I, I found it quite interesting that you know, you know, there was a caveat to that money that the government was giving them accordingly. So anyway, I hope you found the show valuable. Um, you know, we here at Centennial Wealth, we're, you know, we're constantly trying to find ways we can just educate you. But know at the end of the day, what's most important to us is that, is that you are positioned appropriately the way you want to. Um, remember that we can take any portfolio, get behind it, see exactly how you're invested and try to align that with your, your personal feelings, your goals and your objectives is gonna be what we wanna do. So anyway, thank you for joining us uh, today. I, I, I hope to see you next week.